Good evening and welcome everyone to tonight's webinar from the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Uh, tonight, our topic is how to beat the congressional budget crisis, the National Infrastructure Bank solution. Um, anyone who pays attention to the news today knows that we're living in unprecedented times. We have conflicts around the globe that threaten our national security, and in the face of congressional inaction, and some might say paralysis, our proposal offers a way, uh, a path to the future that can provide a solution for improving the lives of millions of Americans. Uh, it'll provide more economic opportunity across the board, and we wanna thank everyone for tuning in tonight. My name is Julie Olson. I'm the chair of the Progressive Caucus for the Alaska Democrats, and I'll be your moderator this evening. We have a great yeah. panel of experts, and uh, we're going to get right to it and um, uh, let them have an opportunity to bring you up to date on the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition and what we've been working on lately. So for our first speaker, we will go to Alfeka Mutardi. She it, uh, has been an economist for the um, International Monetary Fund is, and is now the chief economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Alfeka? Great, thank you very much, Julie. It's really a pleasure to be with all of you this evening. Uh, tonight's topic is how the National Infrastructure Bank can beat the congressional uh, budget crisis. And uh, I'd like to just start off the meeting by kind of giving you an update on where we are with the bill and also specific ways in which this bank can uh, do as it says, that as that act as a budget workaround and fix things that need fixing in our country. So currently our bill, uh, just to give you an update since last month, uh, now has 18 co-sponsors on the bill. Uh, we are actively looking for more. Uh, the way that we've been successful in getting these 18 um, after uh, uh, or 17 after Congressman D Danny Davis reintroduced the bill in June was through state legislators who have recognized the acute needs in their uh, districts for the, for infrastructure needs and have then have gone to their members of Congress to ask them to co-sponsor the bill. And that's how we've been very successful in getting uh, these um, 18 co-sponsors so quickly. Uh, but we're seeking your help uh, this evening to continue with that effort. So I'd like to start out with uh, talking about the, the U.S. budget constraint uh, and why it is almost impossible to finance infrastructure through the federal budget. Currently, our national uh, government uh, ha uh, has a national debt that exceeds $33 trillion. That is, uh, was uh, accumulated over many years, uh, but especially uh, this year, uh, uh, during the COVID downturn, the government spent about $5 trillion over two years. That added to the deficit. And this year alone, the deficit, now that we're out of the COVID downturn, where you know, the economy is humming along, but uh, this, even so, the deficit is still $2 trillion. Uh, now the House GOP wants to take spending back to 2019 levels. The House speakership vacancy is uh, threatening uh, any negotiations on the budget. We could even you know, conceivably face another government shutdown. Uh, this bank is a workaround uh, for financing infrastructure in the face of that budget crisis with no new need for spending, taxes, or debt. Could I ask any, everybody who's coming on to our call this evening, thank you very much, but could you mute yourselves, please? I would really appreciate, appreciate it. Thanks. And so here's an example of how funding through for infrastructure through the budget is not optimal. Please mute your computers. Please mute your computers. Thank you. Um, the the two years ago, the gov the administration passed the bipartisan infrastructure law, also known as the Infra Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, it provided only five hundred and fifty billion dollars of new money, but the fact is that. Our infrastructure needs are much, much larger than that. Uh, we've we've uh, tallied up what the American Society of Civil Engineers say we need as additional money. And in addition, we added categories of our own we think are critical in today's world. And that comes up to at least $5 trillion minimum. So the bipartisan law is a great start, but it got smaller and smaller because 
you know, members of Congress couldn't figure out how to way to pay for it. This this five trillion would be a budget workaround and will provide all of the uh, financing that we need to fix everything. It'll also offset any coming recession that might be caused by the Fed trying to put people out of work uh, to fight inflation. It'll help it'll help rationalize, as I'm going to explain in just a moment, three particular areas of our economy that are in distress. The housing market, food prices, and supply chains. Those are three areas. Oops, I have a spelling mistake there. And it will direct optimal investment into the very area that will grow our economy the fastest. Uh, it'll grow us out of national debt. That's the same thing that happened the last time we had a, an infrastructure bank like this um, during the Great Depression. It'll create millions of permanent family sustaining wage jobs and uh, bolster um, worker training in our needed fields. So um, Julie is going to cut me off in, uh, in three more minutes. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know that I'm gonna come off and on again so that we can make room for uh, our legislator representative from Michigan to speak who is at another function right now. So I will stop in just a minute. But there are three uh, things that I wanted to show you as examples of how this National Infrastructure Bank works as a work a, a workaround to the budget, how it solves the budget crisis. Right now, our number one problem, as far as I'm concerned, is we have a national housing crisis. We have homeless all over the nation. We have 40% uh, of our population who are housing insecure. That means that they're only a paycheck away from being evicted. They can't pay their normal bills, like their rent, their food, and so forth. Yeah and they're very vulnerable. And we have a large segment of the population who are actually living in their cars. Uh, here's an example of a woman in uh, Seattle, Washington, living in her car. Uh, they've had to make room for new parking lots for people to, to sleep overnight in their car so that they don't get towed and that kind of thing. And she is pretty well off. She's from the middle class. She earns $72,000 in Seattle, but it's not enough for her to get <laughs> Good living. So this budget, this workaround of the National Infrastructure Bank will solve the budget constraint. What is the current picture? Uh, yeah, Biden's budget for 2023 has requested $72 billion for the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. That's the entity that tries to work on affordable housing in the United States. That money is mostly used for rental assistance and tax credits to provide housing by the private sector for low-income units. But it, that's that whole policy, even at that higher level of financing, has not failed, has failed to deliver the units. We're way behind on the units that we need. State and local governments haven't been able to put up money for affordable housing either. Mostly they just pass through federal money. Now the GOP controlled house in this budget crisis wants to cut HUD spending by $5 billion or back to 2019 levels. That just goes to show you that uh, the, the, the whole train of trying to address this crisis problem is going backwards. Uh, compare that to what we need. Uh, we need 7 million affordable housing units. This National Infrastructure Bank proposal will provide them. It has $720 billion over 10 years to build or rebuild affordable housing units. Uh, it'll put workers to work in great paying jobs, so it'll help them on their income level. And it will uh, use best practices to develop permanent affordable housing, not this reliance on private capital markets to provide them. It'll also connect um, you know, housing with better improved uh, commuter rail and that kind of thing. So here's crisis number one is the housing crisis. It's, it's nationwide. It's in Seattle. It's in big cities, Los Angeles, Florida, New York. Uh, we need absolutely to work on this working on this crisis. It cannot be done through the budget. This is the only source of major financing, the $720 billion over 10 years to build affordable housing units that are permanent and permanently affordable over the long haul. So that's one uh, aspect of working around the budget crisis right now. A second budget, a second crisis in our nation is the water crisis. We grow in the Southwest 50% of our nation's food supply. And if we don't take care of that agribusiness in the Southwest, it will hit us with higher food prices 
all across the country, fresh vegetables in the winter, um, cattle and uh, other uh, livestock uh, uh, th in the Midwest. Uh, the Corn Belt uh, is com completely running dry uh, because of uh, overuse of uh, water for agriculture. So we, de we definitely need to address our water crisis and how we grow our food. It is not being done through the current farm bill, which is under negotiation through the budget. They don't do anything having to do with water, amazingly enough. That's a different department, the Department of Interior. And there's no money in the budget for any large scale water projects around the nation. The only policy in place is conserve, conserve, conserve. And maybe we shouldn't even grow uh, food that is being grown down in the Southwest there anymore, which will be, put a whole lot of people out of work. So we want to address that. We've had several proposals for how to do that. The NIB will provide 400 billion for new water supply projects, and they include piped water, importation, desalination, reservoir rain capture, primary water, which I'm going to discuss in just a middle a minute, uh, water recycling and irrigation and agricultural conservation. And the places that we need to really focus on, we had, a, fortunately, the, thank the good Lord, we had a good rainfall uh, last winter, and that alleviated much of the drought uh, um, that was ongoing in California, where we grow a lot. That's our largest agriculture producer right there. But we still have persistent drought in the, in the lower Southwest. Now it's extended into Texas and Louisiana. And this is the map of our groundwater systems. Whenever there's a drought, then farmers rely more and more on groundwater. And it's sucking two th two, uh, three areas of problems, three areas of problems. The Colorado River, where our National Infrastructure Bank has already proposed a water delivery system. The Ogallala Aquifer, which is all this red stuff right here, which is a big underground water aquifer that's being sucked out seven times faster than it can replenish itself. And then groundwater down along the uh, the Colorado, the Rio Grande River. Uh, and uh, so even though we've proposed uh, one water solution of bringing water up from Louisiana to uh, to Colorado, New Mexico, and dropping it into the Colorado River to fix that problem, we have another problem along the Rio Grande River, which is affecting New Mexico, Texas, and even the, the country of Mexico. Uh, they, uh, they're they suing each other. The whole Colorado River system needs to be thought of as one unit. Uh, we've, we've had many times Mark Strand on our, on our talks talking about one particular dam in New Mexico that is now uh, run so low on water, it's only got 17% water left in it. It was built by the previous Reconstruction Finance Corporation, uh, but all along the uh, the, the Rio Grande, uh, farmers are growing alfalfa, pecans, very water intensive projects, and they're sucking groundwater dry. So what could be a solution there? This is a second solution that the, the infrastructure bank can entertain. And that is, we have discovered a an oil, a, 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 a wonderful uh, gold mine of water in Texas. And we can develop that water with special drilling that gets down. This is a, 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 um, a water uh, reservoir that was discovered by the oil companies. It's located right here uh, in Maverick County in uh, in Eagle Pass, on a, a circle right there where it is on the map. Uh, it's a thousand square miles around, a thousand feet deep, and we can we can pump water out of this aquifer till the cows come home. It won't affect anything having to do with the water levels on the Rio Grande or even the groundwater under the Rio Grande because it's much deeper than that. Representative Carrie Reingans, who represents uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, I am State Rep Carrie Reingans. I am based in Ann Arbor, but my district actually goes pretty far west uh, for a um, district that covers part of one of our biggest cities in our state so it doesn't include the whole city of ann arbor but it goes west and touches a lot of rural areas so um since my district has some more um, urban and densely populated areas and some really rural areas i have a uh, uh, opportunity to be able to experience a variety of infrastructure needs in this district so um it is about 45 to 50 minutes driving from one end to the other of my district. And that's on 
um, interstate highways, back roads, county roads, paved roads, um, uh, <laughs> unpaved gravel roads. Mm -hmm. So we have a wide variety um, in the district and um, a variety of water sources, which I heard you just talking about just now. So it's it's been um, really interesting learning about the variation across my district and seeing how that really represents some of the infrastructure needs we have across the state of Michigan. Um, my district also includes portions of two different counties, one of the most um, politically liberal counties in the state and one of the most politically conservative counties in the state. So it's, it's also interesting to see how um, voters and residents in the two different counties have been um, able to experience the rollout of broadband in the two counties. Um, in, in one county, there was a concerted effort a few years ago to really push for getting broadband laid out in every corner of the county, including the rural areas. And we're almost done with that. Um, by probably the end of next year, we'll be um, almost done with every household in our county having broadband. Um, in the other county, they um, debated for a few years about how to use their American Rescue Plan, American Rescue Plan funds and debated using it for um, high-speed internet and rural broadband and repeatedly declined to use the funds for that um, or even for other infrastructure needs. So it, it is a very interesting thing to see um, the variation in my own district um, as, as a state legislator. Um, so I know this is a national call and you're curious, you know, about what is going on in Michigan. Um, as a person with a health health policy background, it's been very interesting um, to learn a lot in this um, infrastructure world. Um, we have, uh, as you know, in Michigan, we're surrounded by the Great Lakes, except on a little bit of a border with Wisconsin and a little bit of a border with Indiana and um, Ohio. And otherwise, we have lakes touching Thanks. every border of Michigan. And, and so um, it, water quality is something very important to Michiganders. And this is through, you know, our Great Lakes themselves, but also all the waterways and um, how we deal with wastewater, how we deal with stormwater runoff is, is something that Michiganders actually are very passionate about, which is one thing I didn't know before I ran um, for this office as a person who is really focused on health and public health. You know, I, ha I had a vague understanding that you need to figure out where does the poop go. But, um, you know, I beyond that, it, I hadn't thought as much um, about uh, how we organize our water systems in Michigan. But with my district that's somewhat urban on sewer and somewhat rural on septic, um, I have learned a lot about that type of um, uh, that the the need to think more about how that water quality happens. Um, so I've been working with a colleague of mine from Grand Rapids, which is on the other side of Michigan, near Lake Michigan, and we have a couple bills in the state of Michigan House of Representatives that are um, focused on updating our state's septic code. We actually don't have a statewide septic code in Michigan. We have a couple. Um, counties that have more regular inspections or some townships that have more regular inspections, but for the most part, people don't have inspections uh, on a regular basis here in Michigan. And that's something that we're hoping to change to make sure that we can protect that groundwater here. Um, another thing that I've been working on, which is a little bit related to water in Michigan, um, but not directly the way that um, other other work might be, is that um, I've been working with some of our tribal partners here in Michigan. We have 12 federally recognized tribes and a lot of other tribal people from different tribal nations. And we've been working to designate Manuman wild rice. Manuman is the Anishinaabe word, um, the Great Lakes area word for wild rice. We've been working to designate that as our state native grain. And that's like a, you know, symbolic step. But this type of wild rice grows in healthy, unpolluted, clear uh, waterways. And 
there used to be this wild rice growing in rivers and even the edges of the Great Lakes near the mouths of rivers for hundreds of years. And there's been a lot of efforts to restore this. It's been restored very well in uh, Minnesota and in Wisconsin. And we're really working hard to restore that here in Michigan, which requires us to have clean waterways. So it, this is just one step that we're trying to take to make sure that there's multiple reasons to uh, ensure clean water. We also have in Michigan hundreds of sites that have been confirmed by our state's um, environment, um, environmental department. Um, we have hundreds of sites that have been contaminated by PFAS. And now we're working on a package of bills to make sure that we are testing for PFAS in a more regular way across our state, that we have um, blood testing of humans and making sure that that's covered by health insurance of various types. Um, and so that that's another thing that we're really concerned about here in Michigan. And um, my house, my state house district actually lays within um, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell's congressional district. And she is also very focused on PFAS and very concerned about this. So oh, this wow. is something that um, we, we, we are talking about a lot in, in my region. Um, so I've heard a couple of people chiming in. I'm not sure if there's questions or if there's something specific I could talk about for anybody, um, if, or if there's anything specific folks want to know about Michigan. Hey, thank you, uh, Representative Reingans. Really appreciate you being here. And I think the really important thing is for people on the call to hear that we have this commonality of interest across the nation. And later in the call, we're going to be hearing from other representatives from uh, states from the East Coast to the, the West Coast and from Florida. And uh, we all have infrastructure needs. And, and it's um, why we've seen such uh, growing support for establishment of an infrastructure bank, because it would be available to address all of these different needs that we have around the country. So thank you for being here. And uh, I think we will uh, go on with our speakers. And in order to, to stick with our timeline, in fact, that we're going to have to catch you later. Um, we're going to go to uh, Dr. Andrew Winnick. He is uh, a retired professor emeritus of macroeconomics and monetary theory from Cal State University in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Winnick, you're on. I'm glad to be with you all today. It, it's, a, it's a privilege. L let me start with a couple, a couple of things. People think of uh, infrastructure as sort of a nice to have, but I'm going to argue that it's life it's life threatening if we don't have it. That it really is a matter of life and death. We've touched upon a little bit, but let me talk about one other: lead pipes. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of children who are growing up with lead in their in their blood from the water, and we have a some states have plans to deal with it over the next 40 years. So for 40 years, we're going to poison our children because we don't have the resources to replace those lead pipes, just as one example. As, as was mentioned, there are infrastructure plans in place to get water from basically from uh, coming down from the Great Lakes into, into the Colorado. If we don't do it, we lose that food. We've been here before in some ways. After World War II, we had all the GIs, millions of young men, mostly, coming back from Europe and, Japan and, the, and Asia, who had left, when they left, they were living with mommy. When they came home, they had no intention of living with mommy. They wanted to form their own families, and we had no housing for them. So we built 20 million housing units in a matter of a couple of years, and we did it with a program exactly like what we're talking about. We've, done, we've been here before. We've done this before. And if we don't do it, it really is a matter of life and death. Let me make another comment. When the infrastructure bill that did pass Congress, Biden's bill, it was proposed for three and a half trillion dollars, which is less even than we're proposing. It came out at about half a trillion. And as we knew then what we needed, and we didn't do it. Fine, another point. Where does the money come from? I mean, Alpaca can talk more about that more, but basically what we, the key thing is it cannot come from the budget. That's just not there. There's no way, especially given this Congress 
and the, and the divisions in this Congress that there's any possibility of getting a bill that would begin to approach the tr tremendous needs we have, the two thirds of our high, highway overpasses and bridges, which are considered unsafe by civil engineers. The point of this sort of bill, and the important thing is we've done this before. We, we did it after, after the Revolutionary War. We did it during the Civil War. We did it to get out of World War II and the Great Depression. This is a tested method. It's not new. There are ways we, we can basically not go through the budget, but take advantage of the fact that we have 25 to $30 trillion in government bonds that are already outstanding. And we can basically repurpose those government bonds in such a way as to form the capital basis for, for the infrastructure bank, which the infrastructure bank can then loan money to make all these things happen. It would only loan money to public agencies. We're not talking about you know giving some corporation a profit. Public agencies would be with low interest rates, and it would be with very generous terms in terms of payment repayment periods. So the, the, the simple truth is we either do this or we don't do infrastructure. There's no alternative. There's no practical alternative. And it is literally a matter of life and death. I want to make one of the comments. This is a comparison. California, where I live, has been trying to build a high-speed train, to, which is a, has a, all sorts of environmental and other advantages, from San Francisco to L.A. for the last 10 years, and we haven't been able to do it. China, China has done high speed train all over. Japan has it. South Korea has it. All of Europe has it. Every major industrial country. You can go from Portugal to Czech Republic, from Italy to. How did they do it? They all did it with an infrastructure bank. All of these countries did it with an infrastructure bank. China has three. Germany has one. France has one. England has one. So, I mean, th this, we're not talking about something that's brand new, that hasn't been tested. This is a well-tested thing. We know how it runs. And one last thing, and I'll be quiet. <laughs> we came out of World War II with our national debt well over 100% of our GDP. You know, we had a debt as big as our total GDP. A few years later, it was only 12% of our GDP. Do we pay it off? No, we didn't pay off a single penny. We grew the economy. We grew the economy. If you measure the debt as a percentage of the economy, there's two ways of doing that. Reduce the debt or grow the economy. This bill will grow the economy. We, we can literally double with this bill. We could double the growth rate of the American economy, and so and, and which would basically make the deficit a not, a not very serious problem. So, I mean, there's a whole series of things we could do. We could talk more. I don't want to go on any longer because I know we, we have a press for time. But hopefully that, that is useful information. And if you have any questions or comments, I'll certainly entertain them you know, later on. Thank you so much, Dr. Winnick. As usual, your, your comments are right on. Um, I would like to mention at this point that um, the New York Times Magazine section just had a great article uh, that came out on October 17th by David Leonhardt. Uh, his article is called Longer Commutes, Shorter Lives, The Costs of Not Investing in America. And this really kind of goes along with, you, with what you were saying, Dr. Winnick, about the, this lack of investment actually impacting people's lives. But one of the things that um, David Leonhardt says in his article is that, well, he's talking about how the poet Carl Sandburg was among the passengers on the return American Airlines flight on that very first day in 1959 of a, a transcontinental flight. And that cross-country flight in 19, 1959 took five and a half hours. And then he goes on to say, in the more than 60 years since then, there has been no progress. Instead, the scheduled flight time between Los Angeles and New York has become about 30 minutes longer. And we should sit here and wonder, how could that be? Why is it that in 60 years, in America, supposedly, we, we like to think of ourselves as the most advanced country on the planet. Why have we not seen any improvements in, in air travel? And so at any rate, it's a great article. Uh, he really goes through and talks about the lack of investment in many areas and how that's impacting uh, the lives of all Americans. And so I'd really urge you all to take a look at that article. And so now we are going to uh, move on to another one of our speakers. We're very pleased and grateful to have with us today Representative Felicia Robinson, who is 
um, from uh, Miami Gardens, Florida, and is in, serving in the Florida House of Representatives. Uh, Representative Robinson, you've got the floor. Well, thank you. Um, I'm just happy to be here, and I'm happy that all of you all are here and interested in um, supporting this, this, mo this movement, because as we know that transportation and infrastructure is really important and it's vital to communities. And that's what we all want. We all want the best for our community, the best for our state, the best for our country. And so when I relate this to Florida, what I think about is I live in South Florida. I live in Miami. And when I have to travel all the way to Tallahassee to the capital, that is a very lengthy drive. It takes us at least about a good six and a half hours, seven hours to get here. Whereas if we had the proper infrastructure, that wouldn't be the case. Um, I do believe that we are paying more attention to it in here in Florida. Here recently, we have started something. We have a bright line and it's, um, it's a fast uh, train that is going from Miami to Orlando. It literally just launched earlier this month. Um, so it's only been, it hasn't even been in existence for a month, but we had been waiting on that for years. I'm going to say at least 10 years, 10 years plus to just receive it. However, if we were able to actually have this infrastructure bank, then a lot of these projects would be a little bit more simpler and it would make life a little bit easier and would just help the economy and everything and make it such an improvement. So that's one of the reasons that has drawn my attention to actually wanting to support this and try to figure out how we can get this information out and get everybody to um, support it and become more active. I believe that when people know better, they do better. I just don't think that everybody knows and understand why, how this would be so beneficial for us in this country. Um, when we compare ourselves and I will say that Miami-Dade County is being very innovative. I know that um, our um, transportation uh, unit has actually gone to uh, Europe and looked at some of their things, and they've been to France, and these are all things that they're looking at because these are countries that do tend to have this uh, infrastructure in place so that they're able to do and be able to move around a little faster. And so being that, you know, we look at the United States as uh, one of the major, the, the number one country, but yet here when we look at our infrastructure, it tends to take us a little longer to get this, these things done. And so if we, if people could just know a little bit more about this uh, plan, then I believe that we'll be able to get more people involved. When I was speaking to the small group earlier, uh, I think last week, one of the things I was saying is, how do we get a campaign around making sure that everyday people understand how much of an impact this would be? Because I think if we can get more, the more people we can get galvanized behind the infrastructure bank, we'll have more success in moving it forward. So it's no doubt in my mind that this is the route that we need to go. Um, it's just making sure that we can get enough people to support it. I support it and I hope that others will get on board. Thank, thank you, Felisa. We really appreciate your support and for being here. And I do wanna say that we've had comments on multiple of these calls where people are asking, why aren't we getting national media attention? And they would like to see El Feca on national television or cable talking about the infrastructure bank. And of course, we would love that too. And so um, I do want to say that we had a suggestion from one of our uh, big supporters. And what he is asking is that everyone on this call could email uh, Stuart Varney at Fox News. And so um, I personally have never watched this show, but apparently Stuart uh, Varney has a show on Fox News where he um, he explores these types of subjects in his program. And if enough viewers email in, then it's quite possible that we could get Alfeca on his show to do a presentation on the National Infrastructure Bank. So if y'all can give the ones out, 
the email is Barney, B A R N E Y, viewers with an S at foxbusiness.com. So, Barney, B A R. Can you put that in the chat? Or is there a chat? I don't think we have the chat going, but um, oh, okay. but let, let me, uh, maybe we can put it up uh, the address at the end of the session. But again, Barney with a V in victory, B A R N E Y, viewers at foxbusiness.com. And the guy's name is Stuart Barney. So please, everybody, give them an email and request a representative from the National Infrastructure Bank be on their show. So thank you again, uh, Representative Robinson, for your support and for being here this evening. We really appreciate it. All right. Um, so for our next speaker, we have with us from the great state of Pennsylvania, we have uh, Janet Diaz, who is a member of the Lancaster City Council and is also the chair of the Latino Caucus for the Pennsylvania Democrats. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I, I just want to let everybody know that um, I was the first one that um, brought forward the resolution to Lancaster City Council and it was voted unanimously um, and also brought it to the Pennsylvania um, Democratic Latino Caucus, which obviously has support. And being someone that has been advocating for um, Puerto Rico, especially since Maria, okay. we've, we've had a lot of issues where still people, um, the infrastructure is deteriorating. So Puerto Rico's roads, the ports, the energy grid and other infrastructure scores, um, minus the first report um, card, issue to the United States of the Commonwealth, we found out that you know engineers groups have basically put a price tag of $23 billion over the next 10 years that's needed to update and repair. And that's why I am um, not only supporting it for um, you know getting what I would consider union jobs, which would be great for those that are living in the island and living in the United States that would have good pay, health care, and the infrastructure is not only for um, those grids, but as also for our grid here in the United States. There are many that live in urban areas that don't have the infrastructure for um, internet service, which we're still working on. And by having the infrastructure um, bank, we'll be able to successfully get what the low interest rate versus a regular, um, you know, bonds that are put out there when you have to. Um, especially with the interest that has gone up so high. So this is um, why I have been with them since 2015. <laughs> and I'm always very happy to, um, to represent um, Pennsylvania and to continue working with the coalition throughout the United States and the um, Caribbean islands. Thank you, Representative Diaz. We really appreciate you being here and uh, uh, sharing your perspective with us. Um, so for our next speaker, we are going to go with uh, Craig Schwartz from Ohio. He is the chair of the Rural Caucus for the Ohio Democratic Party. I'm uh, coming back from a Democratic function uh, in Champaign County. Actually, I was in uh, Jim Jordan's uh, hometown tonight, Urbana, and he was the talk of the town. But um, I'm really glad to hear what the, what the Florida representative just said about getting the word out because that's the one thing that we found in rural ohio the people do not know what they don't know and if we could get this infrastructure bank going and, and discussed in the rural parts of the country when i was driving down to urbana today across four counties and this is you know western ohio and these towns are filled with towns that once had vibrant industries, union paying jobs. These towns were, you know, had you know, vitality. These people worked and contributed their, their boosters and their charities. Things worked, things got built. And to what Dr. Winnick said and to what the Florida representative just said, and to what the woman was just saying about Puerto Rico, my God, we have so much to do. And other countries do it in such quicker time. I've lived abroad, I've lived in Germany and France and, and in Great Britain and everything. And they build things and they get it done. I was in, in France with Mitron in 10 years, rebuilt the whole fast train system, brought in the TG 
TV. And we could be restoring these communities in rural Ohio when we bring back these kinds of jobs and remind people of what they, what they once had, and they've forgotten that. So um, that part of what I do in Ohio, part of my job as rural caucus chair, is to try to bring this message of the National Infrastructure Bank to rural, not just the Democrats, but reach it across the Republicans, talking to township trustees and commissioners, because they've been spending the Biden money the last two years, and they know what it means, what it means to have that federal money to come in and get the jobs done that need to be done. And particularly in rural, in rural Ohio, going back to what, what the other speakers have said earlier about the Internet, I, I, I'm envious of Michigan. To have real Internet in every county, hell, we're, in Ohio, we're light years behind that. So, again, the perk, what I'm driving to be, you know, as rural caucus chair for Ohio is to get the Ohio legislature to pass a resolution that's going to help spread the message. If we can get a resolution on the floor, it's going to, the newspapers will pick it up and they're going to start talking about a national infrastructure bank. And we do what we can. That's all we can do. But the more I talk to regular folk, I was at a wine party in Medina County last week talking about a national infrastructure bank to people. And these guys that I was speaking to all not in agreement. And they were Republicans. So it's a, it's a broad consensus, consensus to be built here. And uh, that's, uh, that's my piece. Thank you, Craig. We really appreciate your input. Uh, we are working very hard to ensure uh, and to work towards bipartisan support for this legislation. So um, our uh, folks in Washington, D.C. are planning on doing some lobbying actually on the Hill in person next week. And they've got multiple um, multiple appointments set up with Republicans uh, in Congress. And so uh, we're really looking forward to seeing the kinds of results that we get from uh, the meetings that we have scheduled for next week. Okay, now we have a couple um, additional speakers. I'm not sure if they're on the phone uh, just yet or on the line. Is Senator William Holland from New Mexico um, here? Yes. Oh, yeah. hello, Senator Tallman, and welcome. You have the floor. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak this evening. Um, you know, this is an extremely important uh, subject. You know, we used to be the envy of the, of the world 30, 40 years ago, but we've fallen way behind. Now we only rank 15 or uh, most of Europe is ahead of us. Uh, China is way ahead of us. And uh, we really have a lot of catching up to do. The Biden bill that was passed, uh, signed almost, it'll be two years uh, next month. A lot of that, most of that money hasn't even gotten out. That's a big problem. Uh, the gentleman was already talking about Europe, not there. Not only do they get projects uh, done faster, uh, that certainly is a big problem here in the United States. Um, so here, just to give you an example of uh, the, the Biden uh, bill was only 1.1 trillion. We need a minimum of five trillion. But just to give you an example of why that is uh, far too small, here in New Mexico, uh, there were 13 categories in the Biden bill. Uh, we don't want to get any money from several of them. We're getting um, no money for grid. We, and we're the second sunniest state. We're the fifth windiest. We got a lot of potential. For renewables, no money for grid. Water, uh, we had the state engineer recently quit because he says he needed $2 billion for water infrastructure. We're only getting $350 million from the Biden bill. That's one sixth of what we need. Roads is the only category where we're getting a sufficient amount of money. So I asked my good friend Stu Rosenblatt, who puts these meetings together, I said, Why is that? Uh, yeah, we're getting 74 cents of every dollar we're getting from that bill, even though there's 13 categories, we're getting 74 cents of every dollar we're getting for roads and bridges. You can make a good argument that's not our greatest need. A, a great need, but not that great a need. 
So he says, I said, he says that it's because the, uh, the highway contractors and the uh, automobile dealers have a disproportionate amount of power. Um, so, and then uh, the broadband, we have, uh, it's going to cost $2 billion to provide everyone in our state with broadband. We have 25% of our citizens that don't have access to broadband, and we're only getting $100 million. So that's 1 20th of what we need. So the Biden bill falls far short of what we de need. Stu asked me to share with you people what I've been doing uh, here in New Mexico. We have three congressmen. I have two of the, our three congressmen have signed on um, to the bill, the NIV bill, through my efforts. I'm going to be sponsoring a resolution in the New Mexico State Senate in the upcoming session in January. Um, Zoom meetings. I've been on dozens of these Zoom meetings, like we're having tonight. Op-ed. I've uh, I've uh, facilitated the uh, publication of two or three uh, statewide op-eds regarding the NIB. And this year, at the uh, National Council of State Legislators held in Indianapolis this summer, I had a resolution in the Infrastructure and Transportation Committee uh, regarding the NIB. There were twelve resolutions. My resolution generated more discussion uh, than any other, and um, it, but it failed on about a ten to twelve vote. So, also uh, came across some figures recently. Show the percentage of total spending of. Uh, of different countries. And uh, China is 4.8% of their, uh, their uh, three, wait a minute, four, seven, six, oh, I got this thing. Five. It's probably of their GDP. Oh, here, I'm sorry. Uh, share A share of, China spends 4.8% of its uh, of its federal uh, no, I'm sorry, four point eight percent of their G GDP on uh, infrastructure. The United States spends 0.5. So the China is spending ten times more than we are. Europe, Europe, the average in Europe runs between uh, 0.8 and 1.5. So. Europe's averaging about 1.2%, which is uh, two to three times more in the United States, China spending time. I've been to China twice, and it'll blow you away. They're far ahead of us on infrastructure. You know, I think they have a goal to take over the world. Catastrophic failures of such as bridge collapses, which just happened in Colorado over the weekend, and dam failures, inadequately maintained roads and trains, waterways cost billions of dollars, in lost economic productivity by increasing efficiency and reliability and lowering transportation costs that will boost long-term U.S. competitiveness and insulate the economy from shocks and create jobs. A 2022 analysis by the World Bank found that every public dollar invested in infrastructure led to a dollar and a half in resulting economic activity with a bigger effect during recession. So the, the earlier, a few minutes ago, a guy talked about the public doesn't know what they don't know. Well, that's, he's absolutely right. But I, we, I got, I, I'd say half the legislators in, New Mex legislators in New Mexico don't know what the NIB is when I ask them about it. So that, you know, that, that shows how misinformed and uninformed the public is, including uh, state legislatures. This country is in decline. Uh, I'd like to put a big plug in for Stu Rosenblatt and his wife, uh, Angela, and also for, to Alfeca Mutardi, who you heard from earlier. She, we're lucky to have her. Uh, she's probably one of the foremost experts in America uh, on this subject. And I just want to put a shout out to them. So I've been dealing with Stu uh, for almost three years. Uh, when I first met him, I was a little leery. Uh, but then, I, you know, I said to myself, you know, this guy is smart. 
and I could learn a lot and he's funny. So I changed my mind, you know, first impressions are not always the best. And uh, so, yeah, my first impression are good, but then I have become good friends with him and he's, he's, I've learned a lot from him. So uh, if you get a, uh, if you get a call from Stu, I would encourage you to, uh, to uh, work with him and volunteer and, 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 and get involved um, because this is such an important, it's such an important issue uh, that we need to uh, tackle and we have a good story to tell and um, pre appreciate uh, all of you uh, who are on tonight and would encourage you to get involved. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you, Senator Coleman. Senator Coleman has been one of our stalwart supporters in the Southwest. He's done a, a tremendous job in New Mexico in terms of generating support and uh, getting his congressman on board. So I really, really appreciate everything you said, Senator Coleman. Now, I do want to say that um, in marketing, what we say is that it's not enough to tell people something once. You have to tell them that thing seven times before it really sinks into their consciousness. So, um, so we need to keep contacting our Congress people, and it's not to say that they're, um, you know, they didn't listen the first time or whatever. But people have huge demands on their time. They're very busy. They get distracted, and so oftentimes, you know, we need to contact people more than once. It might be two, three, four, five, or, or seven times that we need. To before they start paying attention. So I would just like to uh, encourage everyone to, to not feel bad if your congressperson doesn't um, return your phone call the first time, we should call them again. So um, our final speaker for the evening is Assemblywoman Joanne Simon, who is from the New York Assembly. We've been uh, making great strides in New York. We have a lot of activities going on there in terms of education and raising awareness of the National and so, uh, Joanne, uh, give us an update on what's happening in New York. Well, thank you. Um, um, I, hi, uh, sorry, I had uh, trouble getting online earlier. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm in an, an alternate location, so I apologize if there's any noise in the background. Um, I am uh, working hard on this. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. And um, I know that um, at least part of my district made some national headlines uh, about two weeks ago when uh, within a, about an hour and a half, we had enough rain at a particular intersection in my district to uh, uh, inundate the cars up to the, the windows. Uh, we had nine inches of rain in three, in three hours in Brooklyn. And um, we literally had water spouting outside, out the window, the um, out the walls of subway stations. So, um, and that is all because of a lack of capacity. Not only do we have more rain than usual uh, because of climate change, but also we have a lack of capacity. Our sewers can only handle 1.75 inches of rain per hour. And we're routinely getting more than that. And in fact, we had almost double that uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so that is a huge issue, but it's also affecting our ability to build housing. And so while we have a huge housing crisis and we don't have the money to do that, uh, the National Infrastructure Bank would, would uh, make a huge difference in giving us the ability to build the housing we need. In many places, we can't even build that housing because we don't have adequate sewers. Um, we cannot overload that capacity. And in many places, literally in many places, even some cities, we don't have sewers and uh, whole areas are on septic tanks. And if you know anything about um, uh, the sewage infrastructure, you can't be building tall buildings with septic tanks. And so this is something that would allow uh, us to actually get the capital that we need to enable municipalities and towns and counties to build the sewer capacity that they need to number one, keep up with climate change as it's affecting us, but also uh, to provide us with um, housing in places where housing is needed, but we just don't have the infrastructure to take care of it. And um, uh, for me, the National Infrastructure Bank is a way to do this without us being subject to the political whims of uh, federal funding and state
state funding. You know, states cannot do uh, this on their own. They just don't have the finances to do that. Uh, the federal government isn't ever going to appropriate enough money to do the infrastructure that we need to do. Um, and so the National Infrastructure Bank is a way to do that that is um, uh, competent, it is uh, financially uh, responsible, and will allow us to actually get out of this hole that we're in when it comes to transportation and housing and uh, water and sewer capacity. Uh, that is so desperately reliant on, on new infrastructure and an updated infrastructure. And um, so I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about that. Certainly, if you have any questions, I realize I'm a little late and this has been going on for a bit. So I appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want you to know I stand ready to continue to work with our congressional um, representatives. Mine is somebody who is continuing to study this issue. Representative Jerry Nadler has joined on as a, um, a signatory as well as uh, um, uh, uh, Congressman Espy uh, from Manhattan. Thank you so much, uh, Joanne. We really appreciate your being here. Now what I'd like to do is go back to Alfeca so she could briefly finish up her presentation and then we'll be opening up the floor for Q&A. Alfeca, uh, can you sort of give us a brief wrap up? Right, I can. And thank you very much for coming back to me because uh, we had lots of great speakers who brought this third issue that I see as a budget constraint uh, that with the, with the National Bridge Infrastructure Bank can successfully work on, and that is addressing the, the problems with our freight uh, system, our national freight system that uh, has caused huge bottlenecks. We remember what happened during COVID. Uh, a whole bunch of ships got backed up in the port of Los Angeles, sitting there. There weren't enough truck drivers. There was a scarcity of goods all across the country during COVID. Uh, strangely enough, that has now flipped onto the other side of the Pacific Ocean. Now real retailers are canceling orders and all the ships are backing up uh, off the coast of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the bottleneck has moved, but it's really important when we do these kinds of infrastructure improvements to stand back and look at the big picture of what does the nation need? What is the steady state uh, bottlenecks that are uh, in, in play? Uh, the global supply chain affects uh, what happens in the US, but it's also a large on account of our relying on importing through ports and shipping 60%, 70% almost nearly of all of that freight by trucks across the country. What happens when they arrive on the other side of the country? They get bottlenecked up at a bridge in New Jersey. Uh, long, long lines of trucks trying to cross. Uh, there's 10 sh cities that have the worst uh, bottlenecks for trucks trying to get the goods to market on time. So all of this is the big picture we need to work on. Uh, we need to work on the freight rail system, which has fallen into disrepair. Uh, as uh, as uh, Dr. Winnick pointed out, another bridge went down because a, a, um, a train derailed because they're not taking care of the tracks. By the way, these rail companies are owned by Wall Street uh, banks and uh, they certainly should be making the investments to make the rail system safe, but they're not doing it. Uh, we have barge traffic that still relies heavily on the Mississippi River and inland waterways to move corn and soybeans out of the middle of the country, get them to the ports uh, in uh, Louisiana. The whole thing is connected, in other words. Uh, and a lot of this stuff is owned by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which is a mm -hmm. subsidiary of the United States government. It is chronically underfunded through the budget, so it's not fixing its locks and dam system. It certainly needs a big uh, boost. Uh, this is one example of a project that is very important, very critical. This is the state of Michigan. Uh, there are a whole system of locks and dams that move ships uh, around the Great Lakes and deliver up to 90% of the nation's iron ore uh, that is used to make our automobiles and refrigerators. Whenever we go to the store and we buy something off the shelf, whether it's a, a head of lettuce or a, a, a new refrigerator, we should ask how and where did it come from? And if it, and it, if it came through something like this, a lock system that needs improvement, we need to make sure that, that that lock system is getting the funding that it needs. Unfortunately, 
the Biden administration set aside $700 million to prepare this one particular set of locks called Sioux locks. Uh, but uh, that's only half the amount of need, the money that's needed. This is very typical. You cannot do infrastructure improvements on a year by year budget basis. It just doesn't work uh, because then somebody's going to come along and they're going to say, cut, 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 cut this. We need a long term institution for funding infrastructure and directing the investment at that infrastructure. Here is the original lock that was built in the 1800s to move furs uh, over to Europe. Here's the second lock that was built during the 1930s using money from the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the previous bank. And here is the new lock that we, we need to be built to move uh, goods in and out of all of these uh, uh, industrial areas in this, air, in this whole area. And the National Infrastructure Bank will top all that up. The NIB provides $110 billion over 10 years to rebuild ports inland waterways, which include the locks, dams and levees. Uh, Dr. Winnick said, this is a matter of life and death. My husband uh, came from Libya, North Africa, where just a month ago, 12,000 people died after a dam burst after a heavy rainstorm. 12, and this, is a, this is a country with only a population of about 4 million. So that was catastrophic for them. Could it happen here in the United States? You betcha. We have 2,200 dams on high risk alert and we don't have money to fix them. We need this National Infrastructure Bank to make sure that we top up everything, fix our locks and dams, dredge the Mississippi River so we can get our barges down river, uh, fix, uh, you know, um, build up industrial areas. If there's a bottleneck anywhere, a transportation bottleneck everywhere, the National Infrastructure ne Bank needs to look at the big picture, coordinate it and finance it to fix things. So I'll just stop there and you, then you can ask me questions for any of the other material too. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alfeca, I really appreciate that wrap up. Okay, uh, now we're gonna go to the floor and open it up for questions and comments. And we did have a question for Don Siefkes. Um, Don, did you have some information on lead service line issues that you wanted to share? Sure, I can. Uh, the three main states that have lead water lines are Florida, Michigan, and Illinois. Uh, total water, lead water lines in the United States are around 10 million water lines. No one knows a super accurate count because it wasn't tracked when these things were built. But it's going to take about $100 billion to replace all these lead water lines. The trouble with lead is that any amount of lead in the human body causes cognitive impairment. And if you have lead in your body as a baby or a small child, you're going to be cognitively impaired forever. There's a great peer reviewed article out there that shows that anyone, that there's 170 million people currently alive in the United States, whose <laughs> IQ is anywhere from three to six points lower because of all the lead we put into gasoline from the 1920s to the late 1990s. In Detroit, where I live close to Detroit, there are 80,000 lead water lines, and Mayor Duggan, bless his heart, was capable of finding $100 million to replace 10,000 of those water lines by going to four different budgets. But that's it. There's 70,000 more water lines, and the excuse given is we can't replace any more because we have no more money in the budget. This bill can fix that, and it can fix it over the entire country, and particular in Michigan, Illinois, and Florida that has the dubious uh, honor of having the most lead water lines of any state in the United States, 1.1 million lead water lines in the state of Florida. And I'm not sure there's even a, a plan to uh, get rid of them down there. The EPA just announced $376 million for water projects in Florida, $255 million of which was to replace lead water lines. That's a drop in the bucket because they actually need to replace 1.1 million water lead water lines. You need $11 billion and 255 million just simply isn't enough. So this bill, I feel really strongly about lead. I don't think it should be permitted anywhere in the United States. And we should replace these things on an emergency basis, not waiting as Andy Winnick said, for 25 or 30 years to replace them. And uh, this bill can do it and it should be passed forthwith. One more 
quick comment. The email, I really support the email that Julia that she read off, but it's only good on Fridays. <laughs> Varney viewers at foxbusiness.com. It won't work tonight, but it'll work tomorrow. So anything you can do to get uh, Alfeca on, on that show or Julie or Stu uh, would be uh, extremely valuable. The reason I like that show is they're all conservative. They're not, the fact is most of us tonight on this call are part of the choir. We need to preach this to people that are not in the choir. And Varney has a huge number of viewers across the country that have not heard of this. And we really need to focus on getting Alpeca or someone else on that show to discuss this bank. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Don, and really appreciate that clarification on the on the sending the email. Okay, um, I would like to ask Assemblywoman Simon if she's still on the phone. Um, our our lead pipes, uh, lead service lines, an issue in New York. It is one of our oldest cities. Uh, yes, definitely is an issue uh, in New York. Um, it is. Uh, I would say that there have been a, a number of replacements of the the lead lines in New York, but I know that it, you know certainly in our state that is an issue as well. Thank, thank you. We've heard from uh, around the country, many cities uh, are dealing with this issue. And of course, uh, let's not forget Flint, Michigan, where it is still an issue. Uh, okay, we've recently had a lot of success in Washington state in terms of uh, raising awareness of the National Infrastructure Bank. We recently had a resolution approved by the Seattle City Council. And we have several folks on the phone here today who are instrumental in those successes in Washington State. And so I'd like to maybe call on a few of those folks and um, maybe you can share with us how you were successful in getting that support in Washington State. So uh, Randy Grind, you've got your hand up. Can you comment on that? <laughs> My favorite subject. Uh, uh, right. uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. Uh, there's a there's a couple of things we did first by being relentless. Um, we've had to hit people multiple times, and uh, the second thing is um, the art of surprise. Uh, very often, Congress critters are terrified of doing something bold, and you need to shake them just a little bit out of their their comfort zone to get them to consider a new idea. Um, Adam Smith was presenting at our um, our, our legislative district uh, uh, Democrats monthly meeting, and he'd come out with all these wonderful things that he wants to concentrate on this year in uh, in the House. Uh, Adam Smith is our uh, is one of our uh, uh, House representatives, um, and everything but one was. Uh, what was infrastructure so i i put up my hand and asked him if, if if he wants all these infrastructure things would he please consider this uh, supporting this bill which would give us the financing we need to make all those things happen he had no idea about it he had not heard of it before uh, he was flabbergasted and immediately demanded answers <laughs> that, that, that's a large part of it and you know uh, I, I've, I've hit Susan Del Bene uh, who's my current Congress critter uh, many times and still haven't gotten, gotten her to uh, change her mind but really that's what it is and uh, we were on the call for, uh, for uh, Seattle City Council I'm putting together similar calls for for the other major cities in the area. And um, that support is really obvious to the people. And some of the things that more conservative people have said about having a, uh, what do they call it? A revolving account uh, is, thank you, Alfeca. Uh, that, that is huge in terms of making, convincing people that, hey, yeah, this will be a, a re recurring thing that you can use as you pay it off for more projects in the future. That really sells apparently small cities. I didn't, I was not aware of that because of course I'm not an accountant. 
Um, <laughs> I know a little bit of eco economics, but I'm not an accountant. That was really huge. Um, hit by all means, hit up every Republican you can, because this is. And when you do, make sure they understand that this is a pothole issue. It's not a political issue, um, and they will listen. Well, I'm, I'm Jim Jordan probably wouldn't, but uh, you know we can do without him. Uh, one of the, I do have one question though, uh, for uh, for the leaders here. Um, two of my favorite economists, of course, are Bob Reich and Reich and uh, 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 Paul Krugman. They have an audience. Has anybody reached out to them yet? Good idea. Uh, Good point. Uh, we we uh, we've tried several times. Uh, the, the 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 really highest economists are uh, difficult to reach. Um, they they have newsletters and things like that, but they're really di difficult to get an audience with. Uh, of course. Uh, Bob, uh, uh, Robert Reich is uh, in Andy Winnick's uh, 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 neck of the uh, you know neighborhood. Maybe he can uh, add uh, something to that. What do you think, Andy? Uh, well, he, he I think he's reachable. Actually, he he does he does these Saturday meetings and uh, coffee coffee meetings as he calls them and so forth. Uh, I haven't really tried, but it's a, it's a it's a good idea. He has influence. And uh, and this sort of thing is right right up Krugman's uh, uh, alley, alley. So I think it's worth trying to reach out to both of them. I think it's a good idea. I plan I plan on doing my part and reaching out to them, but uh, but other people might help because uh, there's no way of knowing whose uh, whose message he's going to they would uh, glance onto, um, especially when you get as much as they must have. Yeah, one. Uh, I'll, just make, I'll make one comment. While I think they're influential, they're influential among primarily the liberals and the liberal Democrats. Somehow we've got to reach beyond that. I know we're trying. A lot of us are, but infrastructure used to be a nonpartisan issue. I mean, Eisenhower built the free, built the interstate highway system and so forth. I mean, it, it was it was understood by Republicans that our private industrial network are, are the business, whole business community depends upon a public a public uh, infrastructure stru structure and and it was not a partisan issue somehow we're, we're into a stage now where all they think about is the cost but this is the way around it as I said and as alpaca said this is this is a way to do it off budget literally I mean you're not not involved with the budget so this should appeal to Republicans and somehow that's that that's a, a, a rock we haven't cracked yet, but if we well, can get a handful of Republicans, it would make a big difference. Uh, it's it's worked. It, it's worked to at least get nods of agreement from the Republicans. I have had a chance to talk to about it. Uh, you're right. We need to we need to hit more of them. And uh, um, yeah. Well, sadly, I, I live in a state that's mostly Democrats. <laughs> Yeah, I, I will make one comment about that, and I'll, and I'll stop. That that is, we may have trouble getting Republicans as sponsors, and being that much out front. If we could get a vote on the floor of either house, I think we'd get their votes. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it's, need, it's really. a matter of public perception, and so it, uh, you know, that that's going to have to be an ongoing struggle. If we don't get the the sponsorship, we at least can get their votes. If they're if they're too nervous about it, let them know that hey, it's if if you don't want to sponsor, at least support it when it comes up. Yeah, by the way, well, just, we're working, just we're working very hard. Uh, we're working very hard right. on getting additional Republican support. And so uh it would be great if we could get some co-sponsors. And but in the meantime, we really do depend on um, on people actually calling your congressperson, whether they're a Republican or a Democrat, so that we can build that awareness and and keep working towards it. And I have some hope that uh, we'll actually get a group of Republicans. Uh, it seems like no one Republican wants to take the lead, but um, but if there were five or ten, you know, that might be different. Uh, 
Um, we have a couple of other supporters on the line here from Washington. I wanted to briefly ask um, Marty or um, Carolyn Barcliffe if you might have any com comments on uh, how you went about calling uh, your representatives in Washington State to get their support. Car Carolyn, do you have a comment on that? No, the only thing I can say is that I preach you can't get in trouble for uh, sending messages to your members of Congress or your legislators um, every single day. And we did some of that, <laughs> constantly sending the messages. But uh, it's um, more Marty. Uh, he has much more information about that than I do. Marty, I know you've been really successful in contacting your local representatives. Can can you tell us your how you were successful in that? Uh, yes, it's just what Carolyn said. Just just um, constant um, reaching out to the to them or their staff, um, trying to form a relationship with their staff. All the staff of all the uh, legislators are, are very very helpful. Um, if you're kind to them, uh, take an interest in them, and um, just get a report going with them. They're very, very enthusiastic to, to help. And once they learn about the bill, they're very, very, even more enthusiastic about it. So yeah, persistence is key. And uh, of course, just keeping a positive attitude, always being, uh, you know, thankful and um, helpful and, um, you know, not too pushy, but pushy enough because you definitely have to have to be consistent with it. So. Um, if you. anyone has any questions, yeah, just let us know. How about Senator Tallman? Senator Tallman, you were instrumental in getting a couple of your uh, U.S. representatives there in New Mexico to sign on. How did you approach that with those folks? And was it easy to, um, pretty easy to get them to agree to co-sponsor or how, how did you do it? Um, well, thank you for the, uh, thank you for that question. I, it wasn't uh, terribly difficult. I guess I was just lucky. We only have three congressmen. And um, it was, uh, of course, I, um, Stu Rosenblatt told me all of the different techniques to use. Oh, I, I, I guess I was just, you know, it, it didn't, it took several phone calls. Um, but maybe, you know, I realize that there are a lot of, uh, this is not easy, and uh, it is, it, you have to be persistent. I, I, that, I pride myself on being persistent. So I, you know, I, I just uh, yeah, had called several times, but maybe I was just lucky and fortunate. And uh, maybe I happen to have forward thinking uh, congresswomen. We have two, two congress, the two congress persons that signed on were both women. The third one is a newly elected Democrat, but he's in one of the tightest races in the country. It's a 50-50 race. And although I, I've reached out to him and there are other, pe other folks here in New Mexico that are reaching out to him. And I guess that one's been, is gonna be a little more difficult because we haven't, we've been working at it for a while and we haven't, got a, we haven't gotten too far, so. I guess I was fairly lucky with the first two. And actually, the two congresswomen signed on a couple of years ago before we changed the, the bill number. So we had to go through the same procedure, calling them and getting to, uh, I forget the terminology, register their name. But anyway, that was quite easy to get them to sign on to the new bill number. That only took, you know, one or two phone calls. But um, again, we're still working on the third congressperson in our state, but uh, he's, in, he's in a tough, uh, very competitive race, and uh, that's proven to be a little more difficult. But I would say this important, most important thing is to be persistent, just keep calling. Thank you. I think that's really important. That's a theme that's been echoed by many of our commenters here is that you is that you have to be persistent and just keep calling. So um, appreciate that. Um, okay, uh, next I'd like to throw out a question to Alfeca and 
uh, Dr. Winnick, our economist, and I'm wondering, can you explain for us uh, if the increase in interest rates that we're seeing is going to impact the model for this infrastructure bank? Alfeka, can you so, answer that? Yeah. Are you concerned about the increase in interest rates? Right. All, all Right now, all interest rates are rising. The, when, the ones that rose the fastest were the short-term rates, the, uh, you know, several month or one year uh, treasuries rose. And now the 20 year and the 30 year treasuries are catch catching up. Uh, they're still only about uh, around the 5% mark. The bank will operate just like any other bank. So the model for its operations is it lives off the difference between the interest it charges on its loans and the interest that it has to pay to bring cash in in the form of deposits or by some other means. So uh, as the interest rates rise, then all of this is rising as well. Uh, that is true for the municipal bond market, uh, other sources of financing, uh, um, the rates are rising. So um, it's very much the case that this bank will still provide the lowest cost interest at any point in time. Uh, the rates are rising, but it will provide the lowest cost interest to finance projects. And there is a capacity in the bank to refinance loans if the interest rates come back down again, the same way that you do on a house. So with that, I can see if Andy has any anything to add. Yeah. I'll just add a quick comment. I mean, right now, for example, the prime rate is up around seven and a half percent. Mortgage rates are between seven and eight percent, but the the rate on the government bonds is still a little below five percent. So the, the the bond rate is gives you the lowest possible rate that's going. You know, it is it is it is you know, unless the Republicans, I'm sorry to say, you know, go start going again to uh, not pay the national debt. <laughs> that, could, that could impact it, but leave that leave that subject alone for the moment. But typically, the government bond rate is is the lowest, really one of the lowest in the country, uh, compared to commercial rates. And what we would be doing is doing that, and we would guarantee two percent above that rate. So if someone had a bond that was paying five, we 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 would commit to paying seven, and it's and we, that would attract these bondholders to move their bonds to us. And then that would give us the capital to basically start lending out. And as most people don't understand, but 95% of all the money in the United States is created by banks, uh, commercial banks. When they when they loan money, that basically is, is new money that goes out. And they loan out 10 times as much as the reserves they have. And this bank would operate in exactly the same manner as, as a commer commercial bank. So that uh, if we, we can get some of that... Uh, you know, twenty-five, thirty trillion dollars in government bonds reinvested in the in the NIB, we'd have plenty of money. So I I think it's a viable model, and it's it's referred to as the Hamilton model. It's first person who did it that way was Alexander Hamilton. I mean, think about it. When we came out of the Revolutionary War, we grew tobacco, we grew sugar, but we had no industrial base. We were totally dependent on Europe. And he had to find a way to industrialize his country. And he created the first bank of the United States, funding in exactly this way to do that. And uh, a lot of people don't know, but the Re Reconstruction Finance Corporation that uh, Roosevelt did, FDR did to such good good extent was actually started by Hoover a Republican, because he recognized that the Depression had started. He had to do something to try to counteract the, re the Depression. And he's the one that actually got the refinance corporation started. And then Roosevelt took it over. So this has been a bipartisan issue o over generations. And it should be again. No, be quiet. Th thank you, Dr. Winner. Um, one of the other common questions that we get on our webinars is people are asking, about where are we going to find the workers? We have we don't have enough workers the way it is to to fill all the, the employment opportunities here in the US. And where are we going to find all those skilled uh, workers in the trades that are actually going to build these infrastructure projects? And we're lucky to have an expert on that topic here with us uh, in the person of Lou Spencer. He is with the Building Trades out of Virginia, I believe. And Lou, could you briefly address that question about where are we going to find the skilled workers to build all these projects? Sure. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. All right. Um, 
Yes, uh, the building trades operate nationally throughout the United States and for that matter in Canada. Um, we have apprenticeship programs, uh, much like the one that uh, my local union operates. Uh, we're bringing in 100 new apprentices this year. Uh, we have a massive recruitment effort underway. Uh, during COVID, the trades were considered essential. So there are a lot of people out there that were rethinking their careers and we're seeing a lot of people that uh, uh, a lot of young people want to sign up for the trades, but um, other people are rethinking their careers. They saw the construction workers going to work every day during COVID, and a lot of people thought that was pretty neat. So uh, we're seeing adults come in to the local union for membership. We'll find the people. As long as the work is bid on a level playing field, which the National Infrastructure Bank will do, um, you're going to have high road contractors prof providing wonderful career opportunities for a lot of people. And one thing on workforce development, if you're going to have workforce development in your state, you're going to need housing. And we talked about that earlier. The homes will need to be built. The infrastructure needs to be built. And uh, what a wonderful way to grow the U.S. economy. Um, I'm a firm believer that we're not going to pay off this debt. We're not going to take care of this deficit. But as many of the speakers said earlier, we can certainly make a good effort at outgrowing it. So um, I just traversed Northern Virginia, um, out late again in various meetings tonight, and I can promise you that we need an infrastructure bank. Thank you. Thanks, Lou. Uh, appreciate your insight. Okay, uh, we are going to be wrapping things up here soon, so we're going to take our last question of the evening, and then we have some closing slides. So, Timothy Bruning, you've had your hand up. Do you have a brief uh, question or comment? Yes. Representative Barbara Lee is a co-sponsor of H.R. 4052 and is also running for the U.S. Senate. Why isn't she talking about the NIB and her Senate campaign? It's a big opportunity missed. You know, that is a good question. And I think what we'll do is we'll hit up some of our California folks and have them call uh, Representative Lee's office and, and ask her about that because certainly California has some huge infrastructure needs. Um, and that just reinforces the need to not just call them once, but to keep calling. In the words of Senator Coleman, persistence. Okay, um, so what I'd like to do is go to our uh, closing slides. I'd like to ask again uh, that everyone on this call call your member of Congress and ask for a meeting. If you're fortunate in getting a meeting, uh, your friendly staff and volunteers with the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition will be happy to get on the call with you and do the help do the presentation for your congressperson. And so again, we're asking them to support HR 4052. And you can see we do have an email address on the slide. So um, uh, we'd be happy to assist you. Just send us an email to info at nibcoalition.com and one of our, um, our folks will get back to you and we're happy to assist you in contacting those Congress people. Um, here's the action page from our website. And um, so we have a lot of information. We have uh, replays of the videos on our website. We also have a downloadable brochure that is very handy. So if you're going out and talking to, uh, you know, members of your city council your, or your assembly or your local representative, it's really uh, very helpful to download the brochure and print it out. And then you can actually give that or leave it at the office of your representative. And so we found that this is very effective also. So please um, take a look at our page. I don't know if we, oh, and there's our contact information. So our website, our Facebook page, our, tw our Twiddle, Twitter, I guess we need to change that to X now, right? Our X page and uh, our email. I also uh, do want to remind everyone that our group is a total grassroots organization. We are volunteer driven and we depend on uh, donations from, from you all and from our supporters to put on our monthly webinars and to, to pay for the advertising we've been doing in local newspapers and digital social media around the country. Uh, so we'd really appreciate um, any fundraising support or donations that you all are able to make. 
Um, we, in the next week or so, we're sending a delegation to Washington, D.C., to the Hill to lobby. And, uh, you know, so all of these activities, it costs money. It costs money to go to Congress and lobby. It costs money to put on these webinars. And so any donations that you are able to uh, to help us out with, we are very, very appreciative. And if you go to our our website, which is nibcoalition.com, you'll see the donate button. I think it's on the very first page. Um, so that brings us to the end of our presentation this evening. Thanks again, everyone, for being here. Thanks again to uh, those fabulous speakers we have. Uh, really appreciate everyone's input.